Well, as Jason said, we're continuing in our study in the Old Testament book of Jonah. And today we come to the third chapter of his story. But before we reach, read the text, I, I want to pose a question to you. Imagine, imagine that you are given the opportunity to speak a word to our city from the living God. This word will only last 20 seconds. You're given an opportunity to speak 20 seconds, either at Rogers Arena or the City Hall or someplace, a word from God to the city. What would you say? I'm going to give you 20 seconds to think about that, and then we'll read the passage. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1 through chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of God. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So... Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word of the Lord reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. And he issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by decree of the king and his nobles, do not let humans, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both humans and beasts must be covered with sackcloth, and let them call on God earnestly, that each of them may turn from their wicked way and from the violence which is in their hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we shall not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he declared would br he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Holy Spirit, we believe that you inspired this text. And we thank you that you've preserved it all these years for us. And I pray in your mercy and grace that you would help us now understand why you inspired this and what you're saying to us in our city at this time. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What an amazing story. What a wonderful miracle. Much greater than the miracle of sending a fish for which Jonah is most famously known. Much greater than most of the miracles recorded in both Old and New Testaments. An entire city, some 120,000 people by God's counting, an entire city, which God himself calls the great city, an entire city about whom God says compassionately they cannot tell their right hand from their left, an entire city hears a word said to be from the living God a disturbing word, an initially offensive word, believes the word and acts on it. The whole city, from the greatest to the least, hears a message spoken by a prophet from another country, takes the word seriously, so seriously it enters into an intense time of repentance, and 
as is promised to all who repent, 120,000 people find mercy, grace, and release on new life. What a wonderful miracle. The miracle of a great awakening for which many of us are praying in our time. And we can pray for this miracle because of God's heart for cities. Nowhere in the Bible is his heart for cities more clearly revealed than in the Old Testament book of Jonah. The book is all about the holy living God's heart for cities. That is, the book is all about the holy and living God's feelings for cities. Not just God's vision for cities, not just God's ideas about cities, not just God's plans and purposes for cities, but God's feelings. The book is all about getting his people, God's people, to feel for the city what God feels for the city. And in the miracle we just read, we see where God's feelings for the city lead. God's feelings for the city leads to repentance. A Gentile city repenting at the preaching of a reluctant Jewish prophet. Repenting. Do not be put off by this word. It's a really good word. It simply means change your mind. It simply means turn around. Repenting is something every growing mature human being does the rest of your life. In light of Jonah's reluctant preaching, the people of Nineveh finally faced what they all implicitly knew but dared not face, namely, that they had been heading in the wrong direction. All the trouble in their, and misery they were experiencing said as much. They were making choices with inherent troubling consequences. They were adopting behaviors and lifestyles with inherently misery-making results. And in light of Jonah's preaching, they came to the realization that they had to change their minds, that they had to turn around. They realized that for the sake of their city, for the sake of the well-being of the city, they had to make a U-turn in the road. And so they did. They repented. Centuries later, the apostle Peter, the Jewish follower of Jesus, would say to largely Gentile congregations scattered in the Roman Empire, the Lord is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so, the 8th century city of Nineveh, a Gentile city, a leading city of the Assyrian Empire, a leading city of the greatly feared Assyrian Empire, the hated enemy of Israel, at the preaching of a Jewish prophet, a reluctant Jewish prophet, repents. And God relents. And the people find mercy and grace. And the prophet is very angry and wishes that God would take his life. <laughs> Something's wrong with this story. Why angry? Why does Jonah not rejoice at this great miracle? Because Jonah does not like what God feels for cities. Jonah does not want to feel for the city what a living and holy God feels for the city. Jonah wants the city, the very bad, the very nasty, the very immoral, the very unjust, the very corrupt, the very violent, celebrating, war-making city wiped off the face of the earth. Jonah does not want his and his people's enemy finding mercy and grace. Review the storyline that we have been on these last few weeks. God calls to the prophet, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out to it, for its wickedness has come up to me. Now, wickedness is only one meaning of the Hebrew word that is used in this call. The primary meaning of the word is trouble. Go to Nineveh and preach because its 
trouble has come up to me. Jonah does not want to go and preach. It is his vocation. It's his job. It's what he's paid to do. To announce the life-giving word of God wherever and whenever God tells him to do it. But he will not do it. So, he tries to flee from the presence of Yahweh. That is the name of the living and holy God. Yahweh. Jonah tries to flee from the presence of Yahweh. And he discovers what he had to know. That he cannot do it. No human being can do it. No one can escape the presence of Yahweh, the great I am. And yet, he gives it a try. He ends up on the sea, heading in the wrong direction. And then heads up in the sea, going down, down, down. But the living God, Yahweh, wants this disobedient prophet to experience mercy and grace. So Yahweh goes after Jonah on the sea and then in the sea. Yahweh sends a fish to rescue Jonah, heaving him up on the dry land. And presumably, Jonah then makes his way back to the place where he first met God. There the word of the Lord comes a second time. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I will give you. That is, go and speak what I want you to speak. The implication being only what I want you to speak, nothing more and nothing less. So he goes, reluctantly. But at least he goes. Fearing the worst. Fearing not that the city will reject him and his preaching, which is my fear, but fearing that the city will actually listen and respond and find mercy and grace that he does not want the city to experience. Finally, he arrives at the place he does not want to go to do what he does not want to do. And the text says that Nineveh is an exceedingly great city. Literally, it is a great city to God. Meaning, this city is important to God, great to God, much on God's heart and much on God's mind. The text also says it took three days to go through it, or a three days walk. Now, this three days walk is an idiom, and it refers to a formal visit to an ancient Near Eastern city that involves a three-day protocol. Old Testament scholar David Wiseman says that the idiom refers to the ancient oriental practice of hospitality, whereby the first day is for arrival, the second day is for the primary purpose of the visit, and the third day for return. Jonah en enters Nineveh, which is a major diplomatic center of the ancient world, as an official emissary who enters, does his work, and leaves all according to protocol. First day, Jonah tells the city who he is and why he came. Second day, he would then go about the purpose for his coming. And the third day, he would leave bidding formal adieu. But, and this is what amazes Jonah and us, the miracle begins the first day. Did you notice that? On the first day. He has only just begun to tell people why he came, and they're already repenting. On the first day, he told them what he would be preaching the second day. Yet, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And it's on the first day that the people start repenting. The text says, the people believed in God, verse 5. And in other chapters of the Jonah story, the term is Yahweh, as I've mentioned, God's self-revelatory name. In Nineveh, God is net, not, not yet known by that name, only by the generic term Elohim, God. But at least they believed that much and at that level. They call a fast on the first day. They repent so fully that they feel constrained to change their clothes. To wear sackcloth, that's a Middle Eastern way of saying that we're turning around, that we're mourning, that we're seeking. Now, when the news reaches the king of Assyria, he responds 
just as his subjects did. It's amazing. The text says, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in the ashes. Amazing. A powerful, a powerful ruler witnesses a popular uprising in his city, and he joins the uprising. Because he's a political opportunist and wants to signal that he's one of the people? No. The king repents because he also realizes, in light of Jonah's reluctant preaching, that his own policies are causing trouble for the city. He then issues a decree calling for even deeper repentance. No food for a season. I mean, that's dramatic enough. And then he says, no water. Holy moly calling on all the citizens to call on the living God. And then the text says, God saw their deeds. Their theology might not yet be all that it needs to be. They're still calling God by the generic term, not yet Yahweh the great I am, but their actions speak volumes. Repentance is always manifested in actions. And God sees in the actions of these people genuine faith, and true repentance. And the text says, God relented. The people rejoiced, and the prophet was ticked. This amazing story, this wonderful miracle, raises so many questions. And let me this morning just ask three. Question one, why did the city repent? Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. <laughs> Not all that impressive a sermon. <laughs> Much too negative, right? Much too in your face. Way too negative. Then why did the city repent at such a deeply offensive word? Well, for one thing, dynamics of a specific worldview are at work here. And these worldview dynamics we do not share with our city. The people of Nineveh, along with all the people in the world at that time, lived with a much bigger worldview than we do. That is to say, these ancient people were smarter than we are. They had a transcendent understanding of reality. They believed that there's more to reality than meets the unaided senses. Sometimes that more was represented in twisted, terrifying, oppressive ways, but At least these people believed there was a God or gods. So when a prophet came in the name of a God, they were inclined to give the prophet and his God a hearing. On the first day of the three-day visit, they listened to what this visiting preacher had to say. Another reason why the city repents. Specific historical dynamics at work, which we in our city do not yet fully share. Nineveh had been experiencing a lot of misery, trouble, as God said it. They'd been experiencing a famine, a great flood, potential invasion from other powers, parts of their empire already following, losses on the battlefield, losses in the diplomatic front, social unrest. We're told there were even riots in the city. And most troubling of all, a strange confluence of natural phenomena, an earthquake and a solar eclipse at the same time. Donald Wiseman, whom I quoted earlier, was an expert in things Assyrian. He translated a number of Assyrian documents which give religious interpretations to frightening events, thought to be signs or omens. This document, these documents would predict what sort of things you might expect to happen after, say, a solar eclipse or an earthquake. The king will be deposed and killed. A worthless fellow will seize his throne. The king will die. Rain from heaven will flood the land. There will be a famine. A deity will strike the king and fire consume the land. The city walls will be destroyed and so forth. Thus, asks another Old Testament scholar, was not the king of Nineveh predisposed to receive a message from a prophet sent to this troubled city? Now, in our time, we do not think in those ways. Oh, yeah? How many people are asking in our time, fearfully, what is going on? 
In light of all that we hear and see on the news, what is going on? What does all the social unrest mean? What does all the uncertainty and volatility of the financial markets mean? What does all the change in world weather patterns mean? What does this pandemic mean? What are the implications for this warning about a tornado yesterday in Vancouver? People asked in our building last night, fearfully. Another reason why Nineveh repents, the performative power of God's word. A factor we actually do share with our cities. Words make things happen. Words not only inform, they perform. Our words can heal and our words can wound. Our words can create new understanding and our words can create confusion. Now, if our words can make things happen, think about the words of God. When God speaks words, something happens always. Let there be light. <laughs> and there was lots of light. When the living God, who spoke the universe into being, speaks, something happens, always. Isaiah 55, my word does not go forth from my mouth without, no. My word which goes forth from my mouth shall not return to me empty, without accomplishing what I desire, without proceeding in the matter for which I send it. This is what keeps me going as a preacher. God's word always makes things happen. Not always immediately obvious, but always eventually, always bearing fruit. Even when the word is not all that inviting. I have a friend who was converted by reading one line from the book of Leviticus. <laughs> Go figure. He worked, <laughs> someone loves Leviticus out there. He worked as an airline pilot. And one night, during a troubling time, he took out the Gideon Bible that's put on the, the, um, the hotel stamp. Uh, what am I trying to... Hotel nightstand right there by the bed. Pulls out the Gideon Bible. He randomly turns to Leviticus 19.2 and he reads, You shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And he says, that night, he was converted. I have another friend who was converted by reading one line from the Apostle Paul. He again is in a hotel room. He again reads the Gideon Bible. He opens randomly to Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. He looks to that text and that night as the moment that he was turned around towards Jesus Christ. When Yahweh speaks Something happens, even if the word is yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, one more reason why the city repented at the preaching of Jonah. The word of warning was a word of grace. Grace? Why? The fact that God even bothers to warn means that things can change. Nineveh hears the word, 40 days and yet Nineveh will be overthrown as a word of grace. And it is. It's full of grace. It means that God is not finished with us yet. You see, if judgment had been irrevocably declared, God would not even bother to speak. God would just give what was deserved, destruction, as Jonah wanted. Justice is God giving us what we deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. And grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. And this word of warning is shot through with mercy and grace. Okay. This brings us then to the second question I want to ask at this point in the story. Question two, what was the warning? That is, what would have happened had the city not listened and acted? you're not going to like the answer. The city would have collapsed in its trouble. The city would have gotten what it deserved. Its immorality and injustice and violence would have taken the city down. That is, the city would have experienced the full extent of the inherent 
consequences of sinful choices. Yes, sometimes judgment comes in a direct overt form, outright overthrowing. But most of the time, and this is not, you're not going to like this, most of the time judgment comes in a far worse form, far worse. God lets us have our way. In the Bible, the wrath of God is not emotional outrage. The wrath of God is not thunderbolts and lightning. It is far, far worse than that. The wrath of God is God handing us over to the full consequences of the choices we make. It is awful. I would rather have lightning bolts and, thund- and lightning. I would rather be spanked. It would be much less painful and agonizing. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle of Grace, wrestles with all of this in his letter to the Romans, his letter to the great city, capital of the great empire. And and Paul lists all kinds of expressions of human brokenness and the breakdown of human community. And people think that it is because of these things that wrath comes. No, says Paul. These things are the wrath of God. God is letting us have our way, the inherent consequences of our sin. Three times Paul says, God gave them over. And when I read that text, I cry out, no, Lord, please, do not give me over to my choices. I probably pray that once a week. Do not do that. Nineveh hears in the preaching of Jonah, grace. God does not want to hand the city over to its own ways. God wants the city to find mercy and grace and a new lease on life. 40 days. It's not just a statistic. In the Bible, it's a symbol. In the Bible, 40 days is the period for cleansing and purification. Israel is in the desert, 40 years for refining. The number 40 is a call to turn around. The number 40 says, it's not too late. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Overthrown. The Hebrew word in Jonah's one-line sermon has a number of meanings. Yes, it does mean overthrow, but it also means turn upside down. Great reversal, change of heart. So Jonah's message could mean both. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And in 40 days, Nineveh will have a change of heart. (laughs) And so the city, recognizing the ambiguity in the word, takes the message to be a call to turn around. Which is why the miracle of repentance starts on the first day of the three visit, day visit. Nineveh, The Ninevites recognize that their misery is mostly their own doing. And they don't want the full consequences of their choices. Nor does God, blessed be his name. Which is why God sends the messenger with the message. Now, this brings us then to the third question I want to raise at this point in the story. Question three. What is the message for our city? What message from God's heart... Are we to speak to our city in its trouble? Well, how much time do you have? (laughs) I do not think that the message is Jonah's one-line declaration. Yet 40 days and Vancouver will be overthrown. If God tells us to say it, we will. But I, I, I don't think he's calling us to do that. For one thing, since the coming of Jesus, the message is much grander. And for another, the cultural dynamics in our city are so very different from the cultural dynamics in Nineveh. I mean, tell me about it. Jonah could walk into the city, present himself as a messenger of God or the gods, and get a hearing. Walk into our city and say, "Uh, God sent me with a message. I don't think so. We can only speak when we're invited to speak. We can only speak when we're given a chance to speak, and we have a lot of strikes against us. St. Francis of Assisi was purported to have said, go preach the gospel and, if necessary, use words. Good advice. Words speak as loud as, if not louder than, 
I mean, actions speak as loud as, uh, not louder than words. But historians tell us St. Francis never said that. And more to the point, you cannot preach the gospel without words. <laughs> you can live the gospel without words, creating a context in which the gospel can be heard. But you can only preach good news when you use good words. <laughs> So, if what are we to speak to the city? God sees the trouble our city is in. What are we to speak to the trouble of our city? There are, of course, a lot of one-liners through the Bible. Gospel tweets. Less than 140 characters. Like Jesus' gospel. Mark 1.15. According to the gospel of Mark, Jesus comes on the scene. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Turn around and put your weight on this good news. There's also what we hear in the Gospel of John. John 10.10. 10, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. John 3.7.37. If you are thirsty, come to me and drink. And out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Or that wonderful text, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. Or 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. More. Galatians 4, 4 to 7. More than 140 characters. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those under law, that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. So, I ask, as you press into the heart of God for cities, what word are you being called to speak to the city? I have, over the past weeks, tried to write out some of the things I think I hear God saying. And I've asked others to join me in that thinking, many from the Way Church. Try these out. God created us. We rejected him. The result is brokenness and death. Jesus, son of God, rescues us through his death and resurrection. In Jesus, we are saved. Pretty good. Another, rely on me. Yield to me. Relinquish control and humble yourselves. Your vision, labor, and strength will fail you, but I have promised to sustain you. Another, you are not an accident. You exist because someone wants you to exist. That someone is Jesus. And you will discover why he wants you to exist when you turn around and follow him. Another. There is a way that leads to life in all of its fullness. The way you are walking right now is not leading you into that fullness. Turn around and you will see a new way. The way of him who is the way. Another. You are seeking good for you. It is a sign your soul knows there's more. You're seeking because someone is seeking you. All you're seeking is actually seeking for him. You are seeking because he's seeking you. And here's what I feel he especially wants me to say to the city. More than, 100, more than 140 characters. It does not have to be this way. Sorry. It does not have to be this way. We do not have to live with all this chaos. We do not have to live with this anger and corruption and lies and injustice and relational breakdown and loneliness. There is a God, a good God, a really, really, really good God. This God is always present. Wherever we are, this God is present. There's nowhere anyone can go where this God is not present. This God does not want things to be the way they are. 
this God wants so much more for us. So much so that this God did not wait for us to come to him. This God comes to us. This God has come to the world from the realms of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. In person, as one of us. He has lived our life the way it was supposed to be lived and dealt with all that causes things to be the way they are. He has taken on our sin. He has dealt with all its consequences. He has freed us from guilt and shame. He has set us free from all that binds us. He does not hold our mistakes against us, as horrible as they may be. He forgives us. He invites us to turn around and follow him into the way he meant things to be. This God is so very, very, very good. The God who called Jonah calls you and you and you and you and you and you and you saying, arise, go to the great city, Vancouver, and cry out in its trouble. The God who loves you says this. And when we say, what he tells us to say, a miracle happens. Let us pray. You are so, so, so. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only holy God. What other glory consumes like fire? What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him Father? Only a holy God.